All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on minor consent Medi-Cal, what it is and how to start it at your school-based health center. I'm Sierra Lau and I'm a project director with the California School-Based Health Alliance. And I would like to welcome you here today. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started today. So this webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides are posted on our website and will be emailed to you after uh, the webinar today. And we will be holding questions until the end. If you have questions as they come up, feel free to chat them um, in the chat and uh, we will save all of them till the end. So just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. We do that through two main avenues, advocating for more school-based health centers and supporting and improving the existing school-based health centers. We do this through a variety of ways, policy, capacity building, technical assistance, uh, workshops and webinars like today's. Um, and there's a link there to our website to find out more information about us. And actually, we just want to take a minute to talk about, I mentioned workshops. We have our 2022 conference coming up at the end of this month. Um, it is Thursday and the full programming is going to be on Friday, April 29th. Uh, and it will be held at the University of Redlands in San Bernardino. We hope that you can join us. Just uh, a little bit about our membership. Uh, if you're not familiar already, membership, if you join us and become a member, you get conference registration discounts, which is coming up. So it's good to be a member right before conference. Um, you'll also get technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. And if you are interested, there is a link there uh, to go ahead and find out more information. And we have two wonderful presenters joining us today. Our first presenter will be Sylvia Castillo. Um, she is the Director of Government and Community Affair Affairs at the Essential Access Health, where she shapes and advances the organization's public policy platform to promote health equity and protect and expand access to quality sexual and reproductive health care for all. Sylvia previously worked at Ultimate Health Services, an um, FQHC based in Southern California. And Lucy Hall is an Associate Governmental Program Analyst in the Eligibility and Access Branch of the Medi-Cal Eligibility Division at the Department of Healthcare Services. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and pass it over to Sylvia. Thank you, Sierra. Let me just get my screen set here. And OK, double checking. Can you see my screen? Wonderful. Um, Hello everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and for your willingness to cover such an important topic because you know this is a timely discussion given all that is happening across our country. Um, we're facing a very real threat. Already, people throughout the United States are losing access to sexual and reproductive health care and the very real possibility that Roe v. Wade, the legal case that granted the right to choose abortion care, could be overturned by the Supreme Court within the next two months. Uh, many advocates were working diligently to ensure that California remains a place where anyone can get the health care they need and want. So know that as you explore expanding your youth access to reproductive health care, you're not alone, that we're here to support you in the process and that you are part of a larger movement to make California a true reproductive freedom state. And so thank you all for what you're doing and for being here today. Uh, Essential Access, so uh, again, I'm Sylvia Castillo. I've been with Essential Access for nearly eight years now as part of our public affairs team. And our organization, we champion and promote quality sexual and reproductive health care for all. And we advance that mission through an umbrella of programming that includes clinical training, research, STI prevention programs, and a community education and awareness, policy advocacy work. But our largest uh, endeavor is that we administer the Title X Federal Family Planning Program here in California and in Hawaii. Um, and our Title California Title X Provider Network is the largest and more, most diverse family planning safety net system in the nation. 
And I know many school-based health centers across the state are Title 10 funded, Title 10 funding recipients. So again, thank you for those of you on the call who do this work and for, you know, for serving the communities that you do. Um, our conversation today is focusing on the Medi-Cal Minor Consent Program. And, you know, California grants teens several rights allowing minors under the age of 18 to themselves consent to receive specific medical services without needing permission from their parents or a guardian. The Medi-Cal Minor Consent Program is just one of the many programs that helps teens make use of these rights by offering free and confidential services. You know, minor consent laws um, are a crucial component of public health for a number of reasons. First off, it empowers youth so that they feel confident and educated enough to take the reins of their physical, reproductive, and mental health, and that way be able to make more informed decisions. But these laws also ensure that young people can get the care that they need when they need it, rather than forego the care, which will only worsen their own health and impact the health of those that they engage with. So, you know, which has a larger impact on the overall health of our young people. But while it's ideal for teens to involve their parents or adult, other adults um, in their world that they trust in their healthcare decisions, um, that's always ideal, but most teens, and most teens do reach out to their parents, but not every young person uh, can have these conversations with their families. And so in some, you know, in some extreme cases, the very people they are supposed, that are supposed to care for them are the ones that hurt them and are hurting them. So minor consent laws serve in, you know, are in place to serve as a safety net for those teens living in difficult family situations, difficult home situations. So it empowers them to get the care they need um, when there are no other adults in their home that they can trust. That is actually the main goal of um, having and establishing these laws in our state. Most of you here um, are likely already aware that with healthcare services, you know, what healthcare services that teens can consent to, but it's always helpful to review just in case. So here in California, young people do not need parent permission or guardian permission to get any type of birth control. That includes IUDs and emergency contraception like Plan B. As a side note, California pharmacists can dispense birth control um, like birth, you know, birth control pills, Plan B, and the Depo shot without a prescription. For the time being, a uh, prescription is needed to get those covered by Medi-Cal, well, those services covered by Medi-Cal and private insurance, but we are working to change that. They can also obtain pregnancy testing, abortion care, and get the HPV vaccine all again without permission from anyone, um, and the services must remain confidential. The fact that they receive those services may not be disclosed to anyone without the permission of the young person. And this is true regardless of the teen's immigration status or if they are wards of the state and in foster care. And contrary to popular belief, yes, minors can purchase condoms in stores. There is no law preventing the sale of condoms to teens, but we have heard so many stories of young people being harassed while trying to buy condoms and sometimes being outright refused by store employees. For the second set of services, there is an age floor. Only teens uh, 12 years and older can get confidential STI testing and treatment and other sensitive services like mental health and substance use disorder counseling and treatment. If you would like more information about these rights and the role that mandatory, mandatory reporting plays in cases where abuse is suspected, we highly recommend the resource noted at the bottom of the slide, which comes from our partners at the National Center for Youth Law. Granting uh, young people the right to consent to time-sensitive medical care is not the only step, however. Access is what makes rights a reality for young people. That's why programs like the Medi-Cal Minor Consent Program exist, to ensure that teens can make use of their rights by having the ability to access care that is free and low cost, easily accessible, and confidential. 
because confidentiality is the number one reason that teens report as to why they choose not to get care that they need. The rights and programs we have established in our state to ensure a healthy teen population have worked to a degree so far. Teen birth rates in California have declined drastically um, over the past 20 years by over 60%, but yet the results are not equitable because disparities remain for Latinx and Black youth that experience uh, pregnancy and teen birth rates at a much higher rate than their white or Asian counterparts. But despite the progress that we've made in our state to expand access to reproductive health care to young people, you know, much work remains ahead of us because in one area where we have worsened rather than improved is in sexually transmitted infections. STIs were already skyrocketing before COVID hit, and it is an epidemic that hit us before the pandemic. And it's a public health crisis that is disproportionately impacting California youth. Uh, most recent data from the California STD control branch highlights that half of all STI cases in the state are experienced among young people ages 15 to 24. And people of this same age group make five out of 10 chlamydia cases and three out of 10 gonorrhea cases in the state. So dividing, you know, diving into the programs uh, that are available for young people to access much needed care this chart compares the Medi-Cal minor consent program and the family pact program. You know, we often get questions about what is the difference between the two. So I thought it, I thought it best to place the information side by side. The key difference is in the purpose and mission of the programs. The Medi-Cal minor consent program exists to provide coverage for minors to access the full range of services to which they can consent. It means it, it's meant to be an episodic program and not a long-term coverage program. The family packed program, on the other hand, is to provide family planning care, access to birth control, to people who are at high risk of experiencing or causing an unintended pregnancy. It's to support people to prevent unintended pregnancy. And one key difference to know is the way that income eligibility is determined. Um, I'm gonna pause here. I'm getting a note that my internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me, Sierra? Yeah, I can still hear you. You did pause for a second there, um, but right now I can hear you clearly. Okay, perfect. Oh, uh, thank you. So um, one of the key differences that we wanted to know is how income eligibility is determined. Uh, while both regular Medi-Cal and family PAC looked at uh, the income of the family or the household, the Medi-Cal minor consent program takes into consideration only the income of the individual teen. Um, and the Medi-Cal minor consent program is only open to young people up to the age of 20. They, no, they are no longer eligible when they turn 21. And um, it's different for family PAC because for family PAC, it's anybody of reproductive age. So that's a much wider time period. Um, and immigration is not a barrier, immigration status is not a barrier for either of those programs. And as far as eligibility, I'll leave it there and because I'm sure that our colleagues from DHCS will be um, doing a slightly deeper dive on that piece. And so here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the benefits covered by Medi-Cal minor consent versus the family pack. Both cover all birth control services, pregnancy testing, pregnancy options counseling, and STI prevention testing and treatment. Where they start to deviate is at abortion care. The Medi-Cal minor consent program does cover abortion care, but Family PAC does not, as again, it is a pregnancy prevention program. Family PAC also does not currently cover the HPV vaccine, but that might change within the next year, um, as long as we continue to do some advocacy work. And we're grateful that the governor um, actually placed that in his budget. So we're hoping, hopefully by January of next year, um, this will become a reality and family pack program. But the Medi-Cal minor consent program already does cover the HPV vaccine. 
and medical minor consent also covers outpatient mental health and drug and alcohol abuse and treatment services. Let's also be, be clear that all of these services are covered by regular Medi-Cal. Teens who already have Medi-Cal do have coverage already for all of these services. But some teens may not use their regular Medi-Cal coverage for sensitive services for a number of reasons. Some might not want to get this type of care with their regular pediatrician and prefer to come to you at their school-based health center to get this private confidential care. Maybe they don't have access to their Medi-Cal information and can't ask their parent for the info because they will, you know, parents will start asking questions of like why they need it. Um, so they must rely on programs like the Medi-Cal Minor Consent Program. And some teens have private insurance under their parents, but prefer to use Medi-Cal Minor Consent because they need confidential STI, you know, they need confidential care and they want to feel comfortable uh, get, they per, they're more comfortable getting the care through this uh, pathway instead. One specific um, area where Medi-Cal minor consent can be particularly helpful is with LGBTQ plus teens. Um, they might need confidential STI services, but don't need birth control. So because they don't need birth control, they might not be eligible for family pact, but can still get STI care under the Medi-Cal minor consent. Um, you know, and as we continue uh, forward to ensure that California becomes a reproductive freedom state, we must work to further expand access to essential services for youth. Um, you know, we must work on expanding equitable access for young people and all Californians by removing barriers to over-the-counter birth control, like requiring prescriptions for coverage, Right now, essential access, we are sponsoring one measure, SB 523, that would remove this uh, administrative barrier of requiring prescriptions in order to get over-the-counter contraceptives covered by private insurance or covered by Medi-Cal um, or the family packed program. So we're hoping you know, that this bill makes it along and will become law by next year. Uh, we also must work to ensure that there is a pathway to free STI care for those that need it, because as I mentioned, there is an STI coverage gap that remains for youth, young adults, and, and you know, full adults, um, where if they are uninsured, have no other pathway to care, and they are not eligible for family pack because they don't need birth control, there is no other coverage program, episodic program for them to get free STI care. And this is another uh, piece where Essential Access and several partners are working on, where we're sponsoring a bill to hopefully expand the STI coverage under Family Pack so that anyone that needs it can access it, regardless of their need for birth control. And we also must work at increasing access points for teens to get condoms for free and without harassment. Uh, one of the proposals that's being sponsored uh, by the End the Epidemics Coalition is to create a condom access program at the Department of Education to provide condoms and resources to schools and school-based health centers that are able and are willing to provide condoms to teens um, on their campuses. Um, but we also must work to remove administrative barriers that prevent youth from enrolling in coverage programs, like ending the month-long coverage period for Medi-Cal minor consent, expanding that, um, and increasing the avenues through which teens can apply for the program. Um, recently, um, you know, a great change came to the program where Medi-Cal minor consent, people can now um, apply and enroll into the program online, but we still need to expand the access points um, for in-person. Um, and all of these actions will help protect the rights uh, for, for young Californians. And so my hope is that we have a commitment of providing all of these services to young people because reproductive health is a key part to our, over, or, uh, our overall health and mental health and well-being. Um, uh, before I pause and hand out, I just wanted to share a couple resources 
that we house here at Essential Access Health. One of them that we hope that you can be useful to you all is our team-facing website, teensource.org, that houses, it's a, it's a team-facing website that's uh, developed by teens for teens where they can access all the information they need about how to access uh, sexual and reproductive health care in California. They can even sign up to get uh, free condoms through our condom access project and, and find out where their local, their closest teen friendly clinic is to them in their neighborhoods. We also have this other parent facing resource, which is talkwithyourkids.org, which provides parents with tips on and strategies on how to talk to their children about their sexual and reproductive health care. And last but not least, um, Essential Access, we do have our training arm, which is essentialaccesstraining.org, where anybody can come and learn best practices for STI testing and treatment um, and how to counsel um, for pregnancy options as well as birth control options. And uh, just as a reminder, we're taking questions at the end, but please feel free to put your questions in the chat and I can try to get to them as we go along and then we'll answer more questions at the end. Um, I hope you stay in touch. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Great, thank you, Sylvia. Um, and Lucy, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen. We can't hear you if you're talking. Oh, absolutely. Just give me one minute to share my screen. Uh, Okay. Okay, so just confirming everyone can hear me and see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Lucy Hall. I'm an analyst at the Department of Healthcare Services in Medi-Cal Eligibility. Um, and I'm also the subject matter expert for minor consent. Um, so I want to first thank Sylvia for that um, great overview of minor consent. Some of the things that uh, were mentioned will also be reiterated in this presentation, um, but this is going to focus more specifically on eligibility, how the minor can enroll, and what kind of um, resources there are for, uh, for the individuals trying to en enroll and also providers. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, the authority for the Medi-Cal Minor Consent Program uh, comes from California Family Code, which provides that a minor may receive services related to sexual assault, pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, family planning, drug and alcohol abuse, and outpatient mental health treatment and counseling without needing parental consent. So currently, the Medi-Cal Minor Consent Program uh, its eligibility lasts just one month at a time. So for each month that the minor wishes to retain services, they do need to recertify with the county either in person or via phone. Every month they want to keep services. Now there is an exception in the case of outpatient mental health treatment, um, and we'll get to that in just a few more slides. So minor consent services uh, are defined by three different categories of services, uh, and these all offer limited services to minors. Uh, and so this is determined by age and by the particular services that the minor needs. So we have our first category of services, which uh, is restricted to minors at least 12 years of age and limited to sexually transmitted disease treatment, drug and alcohol abuse, family planning, and sexual assault treatment. Then we have our next category of service, uh, which is restricted to pregnant minors of any age and limited to pregnancy related services. And then our third category of service, it is identical to the first one. So 7P is our third category of service. It's identical to 7M with the, the exception that uh, this category includes outpatient mental health treatment. And then our last one is restricted to minors under age 12 and limited to family planning and sexual assault treatment. 
So for any minors seeking pregnancy-related services, they would be put into 7-in. And for any minors um, at least 12 years of age seeking outpatient mental health treatment, they, they would need to be in aid code 7P. And we'll sort of go over how uh, this was established with the, um, uh, with the county eligible, eligibility worker in a moment. So as, uh, as was noted earlier, all minor consent cases are completely confidential. No correspondence whatsoever will be mailed to the minor uh, regarding their minor consent coverage. In fact, eligibility workers should not even uh, report the minor's address in our uh, Medi-Cal eligibility data system. No contact whatsoever should be made with the minor's parents or guardians. However, if the uh, minor does have maybe one parent with them at intake, that does not affect these requirements at all. All contacts should still only be made with the minor and none should go to the parents or guardians. And so in order to uh, obtain eligibility and minor consent, none of the following are required. No social security number or identify, identification uh, verification is needed. No income verification or related documentation is needed. And no pregnancy verification are needed. So uh, in this, you know, when applying for this, when discussing with a county eligibility worker, really, uh, their eligibility is dependent on uh, their needs, what the minor needs, and also self-attestation, for instance, if the minor is pregnant. Now, so the form used for uh, minor consent intake at the county is the MC-210. So this is not the single streamlined application, which is used for most other Medi-Cal programs. Uh, there are usually hard copies of this uh, This form at county offices. We can also provide you a soft copy via email if you'd like to email me. But in order to apply for minor consent, individuals have to either uh, apply in person at the county office or they can apply by calling the county. So this time there's no um, internet portal where they can apply. And that's really for purposes of maintaining strict confidentiality at this point. So also needed for minor consent intake is the MC4026, which is a request for limited services. You can find this on the DHCS website. We've linked it in here. Um, and it basically is the form which uh, needs to be reviewed with the eligibility worker to ensure that the correct service needed is what they're approved for. So this form will say, do you need pregnancy related services? Do you need outpatient mental health, et cetera, et cetera to ensure that the individual is uh, determined to the correct uh, eligibility category. So this form is required at intake each month, and then it's also required each time a new statement is required from a mental health professional, which we'll get to in just a moment. So uh, for at intake, the county eligibility worker should provide a temporary uh, benefits identification card or BIC for the minor, which can be used uh, as a form of ID. And if the application is over the phone, then the eligibility worker should provide the BIC number telephonically and also let the minor know that they can pick the paper BIC up at the county office. In no circumstances should the BIC be mailed to the beneficiary. And so in order to access services at that, that point, the beneficiary should provide their BIC number to the Medi-Cal provider. So uh, let's get into a code 7P, which has um, the specific outpatient mental health services attached to it. In order to receive uh, outpatient mental health treatment under, under aid code 7P, the applicant must have a letter from a mental health professional that states the following. So it has to state that the minor is mature enough to participate intelligently in the mental health treatment or counseling and is one of the following. A, either in danger of causing serious physical or mental harm to self or others without mental health treatment or counseling, or is an alleged victim of incest or child abuse. So for this case, the minor consent case can be approved without the minor having to recertify month by month for the number of months covered in the statement provided by the mental health professional. So for instance, if the letter states that the minor uh, needs a treatment plan of three months, then for that three months, 
the minor does not have to make contact with the eligibility worker to recertify their coverage every single month. It can just ride for those three months. Though at the end of those three months, the minor does need to make contact and either provide a new letter, which states that, for instance, three more months of services are needed, um, or just continue, just uh, go back to the month by month eligibility. There's a maximum of this on a six months at a time, however. Um, so the maximum length in the letter from a mental health professional is six months. If it's over that, the individual will have to um, report back to the uh, eligibility worker at the end of six months to continue eligibility. And so for the definition of a mental health professional, um, it is listed in the Medi-Cal Eligibility Procedure Manual, which I have linked later on in this, um, in this presentation, uh, and includes uh, a specific number of psychologists, um, uh, counselors, and psychiatrists. Right, so right here, we've got the link to the Medi-Cal Eligibility Procedures Manual, Article 4B. So this contains really all of the policy related to um, minor consent uh, in terms of Medi-Cal, in terms of eligibility, um, and is a really good resource for that. And it is, you know, is occasionally updated if there are any changes uh, to the program. So I would recommend that to be your first resource um, to really get an understanding of this program. And then the second resource I have here is the Minor Consent Provider Manual which has some more detail about the specific uh, services and, and diagnosis codes and whatnot that are uh, covered by minor consent and how to handle those. So uh, if you have any additional questions about minor consent, um, you know, after we have our question session here, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is here, it's lucy.hall at dhcs.ca.gov. Um, and if you would like to request any forms like the NC-210, I can also help with that. And thank you, everybody. I think that's it for me. Great. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, okay, so now we have a good amount of time for question and answers. And we had um, some questions come up, so I'm just going to read them in the order that they came. Um, the first one was, how do you enroll? minors, but I think you, you covered that. Uh, does reimbursement follow the negotiated Medi-Cal uh, reimbursement rate? Also, is health education covered like family pact? Not sure, hey, Lucy. Lucy. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's an eligibility question, so I may have to, you know, take that back and, and talk to our folks at um, you know, in billing or uh, benefits. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. Uh, Immuniz uh, I've had this question. Immunizations given, for example, HPV, um, and entered into CARES, is there a way to hide that vaccine if it's a minor consent situation? What I can mention is that we have heard from folks across the state that this is a confidentiality issue. And there are people working to try to figure out a solution. Um, as of right now, there is no way to prevent that, that we're aware of. But um, again, it's something that advocates have noted. So it's on the table as it's part of like on our to-do list of something that needs to be addressed to ensure that teens can continue accessing the service confidentially. Um, how do you access the county eligibility worker to start services for a minor? Sure, so in order to obtain services, the, the minor themselves would have to either go to the county, um, go to a local county office, or um, call a county office number. Um, and then at that point, they'll be able to request minor, minor consent and their eligibility, eligibility at the county who will be able to make themselves available for intake um, at the phone or in, uh, in person. 
So check your local county office. And so I just have a follow-up question. So if, um, if a school-based health center that does not currently offer minor consent Medi-Cal, I, 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 when I previously worked here, well, we were already hooked up with the county and had an eligibility worker that came regularly. If they wanted to start processing minor consent Medi-Cal at their school-based health center, would they be that same process in, our, in terms of starting services? They would reach out um, to like their local county office to find out how to get an to be connected with an eligibility worker to process, you know, their um, yeah, what handful of applications. Yeah, absolutely. That so as long as it's the county eligibility worker, you know, intake is similar to with medic regular medical in terms of having an eligibility worker come in and process help you process that. So yeah, there would need to be a county. Um, eligibility worker there, and if you can connect with the county, and um, you know, some county, some eligibility workers are trained in minor consent intake, some are not. So if that's something you're interested, I'd really recommend you know connecting with the county and make sure that's something um, that you'd like to have uh, an eligibility worker available for. Thank you. Um, can a mental health provider at a school-based health center provide the Leonard for outpatient mental health services um, for? Uh, aid code 7P, or does the youth have to get a letter from the mental health provider associated with their insurance? No, it does not have to be um, a mental health provider associated with their insurance. Um, so the letter itself can be from any uh, mental health professional, and I'm just pulling it up right here. It's in the um, the minor, I'm sorry, the Medi-Cal eligibility procedures manual. There's a specific list. Um, and that includes, uh, so that includes a, a licensed marriage, family, and child counselor, a licensed clinical social worker, licensed educational psychologist, or credentialed school psychologist, clinical psychologist, licensed psychologist, or a psychiatrist. So any of those professionals that need not be associated, you know, with the minor's insurance or whatever can provide this letter that the minor can then bring to the county. Thank you. Um, do you have a number of how many young people have minor consent Medi-Cal in California? Yeah, I do not have this data at this time. Um, I'm, we may be able to provide some numbers via an official data request, but at, at this point, I can't share. Do you mind sharing what gender affirming care is covered under minor consent and FPAC? So I, I would know. recommend to take a look at the um, minor consent provider manual, which is included um, in, there's a link to it in this presentation, um, which has some more detail on the specific services, you know, and associated codes that are um, covered by minor consent, because it is a very limited program in terms of the specific services it offers. And I can share that it's the same for Family Pact. Family Pact does not cover gender affirming care. It's very specific to just um, pregnancy prevention, family planning services. Um, man, it just people are, have a lot of questions in space. We have time. So, um, what is the best way for a patient to identify a service a service switch to social worker, i.e., going from 7M to then receiving behavioral health services where 7P is needed to cover both family planning and BH services? Yeah, so this is sort of the um, intent of the MC4026, which um, is on the DHCS website and is linked in this. Um, in this presentation because it has a specific list of services that the um, individual might need. And so at intake or every month, if there's a change, uh, then at that point, uh, when they review the 4026, the eligibility worker may say, oh, well, if you need you know, pregnancy related services, then um, perhaps th then we need to ensure that you get coverage under seven in. Or if you need, uh, as you mentioned, outpatient counseling services, then we need to make sure that your coverage is now under 7P. So um, at, the in point, at the point of intake every month, 
that's when the specific services that are necessary will be determined. And of course, like all Medi-Cal, um, it is a month by month, um, I'm sorry, it is a whole month eligibility. So the services they have, you know, for that entire month last from the 1st to the 30th or the 31st. So if in the middle of the month, they need to change in services, um, typically that would either be waiting until the next month um, or they can revisit uh, the eligibility worker and uh, get a new aid code for that month. But it would the eligibility would last from the first to the end of the month. Thank you. Um, county eligibility worker in our county takes a long time for appointments. My, the minor has to wait that long just and the minor has to wait that long just to wait to enroll, how do we refer to an eligibility worker? Sure, and that's totally understandable, particularly, you know, certainly during the COVID-19 health emergency as um, many offices had changed hours and whatnot. At this point, um, you know, meeting with a county eligibility worker is really the only entry point into minor consent. Uh, so we would recommend the minor actually physically going to an office location if possible. Um, there's usually eligibility worker staff on staff who are present and able to intake at that point. Um, if there's a particularly, you know, long wait for um, any counties that you're encountering, you can also reach out to me and we can um, sort of take a look and, and see if we can uh, have a discussion with the county about those issues. What is the difference between Health and Safety Code 124230 and Family Code 624 so minors can access mental health services? So I think I know specifically what this is about and there is a um, there is a requirement uh, in the Health and Safety Code for individuals to access um, mental health services. And I believe it's different from our standard for outpatient mental health services. Um, and correct me if this is not what you're talking about, but this, this question does come up. So in Medi-Cal generally, in order to access um, outpatient mental health services, the statement from the, med uh, I'm sorry, from the mental health pro provider really just has to be that the minor is mature enough to participate intelligently in the mental health treatment or counseling and is in danger of causing serious physical or mental harm to others or themselves. In Medi-Cal minor consent, you know, these are not the same program. These are not referring to the same uh, requirements. So it is both the, uh, in minor consent, it requires both the minor being in danger of causing serious physical or mental harm to self or others, and uh, I'm sorry, or being an alleged victim of incest or child abuse. So there's a slight difference in the way that, um, in the way that outpatient mental health care is provided to minors under regular Medi-Cal versus under minor consent Medi-Cal. I do recommend that you um, take a look at the Medi-Cal eligibility procedures manual. Everything in there is completely up to date as of now. And all those requirements should be referencing the specific um, uh, the specific regulations that they are derived from. Um, how long does it usually take for this coverage to become active if a patient applies online or calls in? Sure. So this this is an immediate need. Um, program. So the BIC card should uh, be printed at the point of application um, and eligibility should be active uh, as of just right away or the next day, but it is active for the whole month. So um, if there were services that were rendered, you know, on the second and they apply for minor consent and are approved on the 10th, since it is full month eligibility, those services on the second can be um, uh, can be reimbursed by Medi-Cal. If a family already has Medi-Cal as their health care coverage, how do you separate a minor's coverage from their main family family's coverage for minor consent Medi-Cal? Yeah, this is a great question. So um, when we're inputting 
the minor for minor consent coverage. We do not use the minor's social security number. We do not attach them to an existing case. Counties are actually instructed to use a, a pseudo SIN or a pseudo social security number um, to create this completely new record for the minor consent eligible individual. So at no point is it attached to um, the family's coverage or any kind of household coverage. It's its own separate case. Where do teens receive services? Is it at one specific location or are they connected to local sites? Yes, yeah, so for the services covered um, under the minor consent program, they can be rendered by any minor uh, Medi-Cal provider. Right, and that's, um, that's, I just wanted to note because I'm sure the question comes also from comparing to the family PAC program where the family PAC program providers have to enroll and become family PAC providers. Um, and then not, you know, not every Medi-Cal provider is also a family PAC provider. So for the family PAC program, for example, there is a list of providers that people can go towards. There is a website where they can Google, you know, where is my nearest family PAC provider? And it's different from Medi-Cal minor consent because as Lucy mentioned, Medi-Cal minor consent can be provided by any Medi-Cal provider. It's not a program where they have to specify a specific type of provider. It's any Medi-Cal provider that is willing to provide these services. And it's just determined by the reimbursement codes that, that they end up using. Thank you both. And this one looks like it's just a comment, but um, I would just read it out. I like the eligibility worker coming to the school site because if it is confidential, it may be difficult for youth to seek out an eligibility worker on their own without parental involvement, definitely. Um, which is why we encourage school-based health centers to either um, be part of family pact, most are either part of family pact and or minor consent Medi-Cal. Um, does Medi-Cal reimburse for family code 6924? So I believe that's just referring to the minor consent um, regulations and services. So if that's not the case, please do correct me. But if so, yes. So anything, it's uh, all these services and, and the providers rendering it follow normal Medi-Cal rules in terms of reimbursement. Um, they just have to have the specific uh, limited uh, services or as the, the billing codes in order to be reimbursed based on the eligibility of the minor. From the minor patient's perspective, how will they know it's time to renew minor consent Medi-Cal eligibility? Is there a risk of being cut off from the services they started accessing through the program? This is another really good question. And as we've stated, you know, there's really, there's no mailing or notices that should be mailed out to the minor because it's, you know, we wouldn't want to alert um, a parent or guardian of something that the minor is trying to keep confidential or that even may put the minor in danger if the, um, if the guardians or parents find out. So we won't be able to mail out a um, notice saying, hey, your Medi-Cal coverage is ending this month. Um, we've heard from many counties that counties will try to uh, contact the minor via phone. They will not leave a voicemail, again, for a concern of confidentiality, but they will uh, call multiple times to alert the minor that their, uh, that their minor consent eligibility is ending. The minor is advised at intake, and it's uh, all written out in the the um, I'm sorry, the NC4026 that coverage lasts for just one month, and they're handed a NOAA uh, notice of action at intake that states that eligibility is just for month one month as well. So, although you know they they may not be able to be contacted near the end of the month when they need to come back in to recertify if they do come back in at any point during the next month then they can be recertified for that whole month so uh 
we understand that this is slightly complicated, but it's complicated due to the confidential nature of minor consent services. Um, so they are the minor at is assured at intake, and this is repeatedly, you know, in the documentation that they can take, uh, and that they sign at point of intake that they just have that one month of eligibility. I just wanted to ask I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Thank you for the detailed explanation, Lucy. And I just wanted to mention to folks that um, we it has been raised over the years that these, um, you know, the month eligibility, the fact that folks have to go in person and it's restricted to eligibility workers, these have been identified as barriers that teens face to specifically access this program. So I just wanted to make folks aware that, you know, advocates, we are aware of this. It is also on the things of like to do to make sure we expand access um, and reduce barriers to care. So just know it is aware. Please do, um, I'll, we can put up my email address again, but it's these, it, you know, collecting these stories of the burdens that you all see on the ground. Uh, the barrier, the administrative barriers that your patients face, um, it's important to collect these stories so that when we're ready to pursue an advocacy strategy or work to try to improve the programs and, and work with our state partners, um, that we have these stories um, already ready and set to go so we can share them and continue to advocate for that. Um, so thank you all for, for raising these issues. Yeah, if I can add one more thing onto that, absolutely, uh, we appreciate that. And this is sort of uh, where the extension for outpatient mental health services came from. So if uh, the minor has that letter from a mental health professional and it indicates the length of a treatment time, then that's, that's fine. Up to six months, the minor doesn't have to come in to recertify and can continue to have access for um, all services covered under aid code 7p which you know are all related services um to um sexually transmitted diseases drug and alcohol abuse family planning sexual assault treatment and outpatient mental health treatment and counseling so all of those services will continue for up to six months based on the length of time mentioned in the mental health providers letter Um, is it often that county eligibility workers go to school-based health center sites to enroll minors into minor consent medical? So I'm not familiar with I, this. Yeah, I can. Or right, Sylvia, do you yeah. want to? I was going to say, I think that's a question for you, Sierra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I wanted to pause, see if anyone had any, and then I was going to go for it. Um, so in my experience, um, the school-based health centers are the ones to enroll the young people in minor consent medical, and then they partner with the eligibility worker to pick up the applications and process them. And the eligibility worker would come back with their big card. Also, or um, school based health center can drop it off and pick up the cards. One of those two um, uh, like options. So forming partnerships is encouraged. It, is, it really is. Is there any advocacy happening around gender affirming care coverage for young folks needing confidential services? There is, and, and I apologize because um, I, I know these conversations are happening and I'm just off the top of my head, I did not prepare. So I can't remember the name of the bills that folks are working on. So I deeply apologize, but I, I'm aware that there is some work happening around um, making sure that gender affirming coverage is available for, for young folks. Okay, it sounds a little bit long, um, but they're, they're stating the code. So health and safety code 124260, and this, they've uh, put it in quotes, a minor who is 12 years of age or older may consent to outpatient mental health treatment or counseling services if in the opinion of the attending professional person, the minor is mature enough to participate intelligently in the mental health treatment and counseling services. Um, does this mean minor does not need to be in danger to obtain minor consent services? 
Yeah, so this is the um, the thing that I was articulating a, a few questions ago. So the minor consent program is not governed by the health and safety code. It's governed by the family code. So this refers to Medi-Cal, you know, generally. Um, but this, the requirements are different for minor consent and still maintain either the A or B that's required to access um, mental health treatment services. 